Welcome to Shelf Life from the Virginia Festival of the Book. I'm Erin Donovan, associate with Virginia Center for the Book, a program of Virginia Humanities. We'd like to thank our partners at Alabama Center for the Book, Kentucky Center for the Book, and North Carolina Humanities, as well as the creative writing programs at George Mason University, Hollins University, Old Dominion, UVA, Virginia Tech, and Furious Flower for sharing and supporting this program. Thank you all for coming. A couple notes before I hand the program over to our moderator. Please share your questions using the Q&A tab in Zoom. This event has optional closed captioning, which you can turn on and customize at any time with a closed captions tab at the bottom of your window. If you haven't already read today's books, we hope that you will. For details about how to buy them from a local bookseller or check out a copy from your library, visit vabook.org, where you can also explore the schedule of upcoming programs and watch past events. While you're there, please consider making a donation to support the festival's ongoing work at vabook.org slash give. Now I'm pleased to introduce today's moderator, Valencia Robin is the author of Ridiculous Light, winner of Persia Books, Lexi Brugnitsky First Book Prize, finalist for the Kate Tufts Discovery Award, and one of Library Journal's Best Poetry Books of 2019. A Cave Cottom Fellow, Robin's honors include a 2021 National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship, you can learn more at ValenciaRobin.com. Thank you, Erin. And thank you to the Virginia Festival of the Book for the invitation to moderate this program. I've had such a great time getting to know the work of these poets and I'm super excited to hear their poems out loud. Our first reader is Ashley M. Jones. Ashley M. Jones is the Poet Laureate of Alabama and the author of Reparations Now, which is her most recent book. Her other poetry collections include Magic City Gospel and Dark Thing. She holds an MFA in poetry from Florida International University. Her poems and essays appear in or are forthcoming at CNN, Poetry Magazine, The Oxford American, Origins Journal, The Quarry by Split This Rock, Obsidian, and many others. Learn more about Ashley and her work at ashleymjonespoetry.com. Take it away, Ashley. Thank you so much, Valencia, and thanks to the Virginia um, Center for the Festival for the Book, excuse me, for having me. I'm really excited to read with Kalisa and Crystal. And so I'm just gonna get right into it. I'll read four poems from uh, my newest collection, Reparations Now. Um, and I'm gonna start with a poem about being a black girl. Um, as a black woman, there's a lot of people who like to put conditions on our existence, our lovability, our worth. And so I wanted to start with a poem um, that sort of affirms um, a truth that I think we should all just learn to accept. It's called, it is entirely possible for a black girl to be loved. Oh, and before I start, I do wanna say that we acknowledge the um, passing of Bell Hooks, an incredible um, thinker and writer, um, and we, we honor her spirit today. So here is, it is entirely possible for a black girl to be loved. See me black as I am and call me beautiful. No revolution necessary, no brave needed, just loving me. It is not unusual to love me black as I am. It is not because I'm so strong, so exotic, so walk on the wild side, what side? See my skin, it's not chocolate or coffee or caramel. It is inedible. It is nothing to see with colonizers eyes, nothing to trap with pity or praise, nothing to bruise, to make purple with your power. My skin is soft, like anything soft. It is a reflection of God. It is a heavenly mirror. Don't you see that? You're there too. Black as I am, I can shine anything back. Even the sun wants to cling to me. 
So I'm going to move now to a poem about James Brown, um, or featuring James Brown, we'll say, because it's about me, but I'm using James Brown to talk about myself. Um, music is really important to me in life and in my work. And um, this poem just talks about this feeling of endless um, confusion and frustration when it comes to trying to date in the world. Um, and it also sort of thinks about um, some of these artists who, um, whose work we love, but who have difficult pasts, perhaps. Um, so this is called Soul Power, James Brown Time Loop. Um, and you know, if you've ever heard the song Soul Power, you know that it has that really interesting bridge section where the horns just keep going and going and going and going. And one day I listened to that song and I got trapped in that time loop. And here's, here's the poem about that. Soul Power, James Brown Time Loop. Everything is color and sweat like the pinwheel that marks a time jump on Justice League or Wonder Twins or Batman and Robin. It's all spinning to the tune of those horns in Soul Power by James Brown, who was, I think, some kind of Superman because he wore a cape, because he could see through you to the white meat, because his heart was wrapped in a blanket of green glowing money faster than a speeding bullet, funkier than George Clinton stewing in a vat of radioactive gym socks. He was the originator of a time loop, of a horn section that would not, could not quit, of a bridge that led nowhere but from one side of his growling throat to the dark, loud other. And it's here, in this time loop, in this trumpeted commercial break, that I see just how caught up I really am. The man I did not love is sitting at my dining room table, gobbling up a cake I baked for his unremarkable birthday. And in the spit shine of his teeth emerges the metal shining smile of the other man I did not love, who did not love me, gobbling up the edits I made painstakingly on his poems. And in the ink, black and boogieing on the page, rose the whiskers of the other man I did not love, framing his slow and drawling mouth, his words slipping thick out of his lips. And then they were all the same man in an endless spinning trumpet filled infinity in which yes, I could get on down, 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 but not out. Every wall, a new man dancing a two-step to a tune that will end in my demise. And James is telling me how I got to got to feel it. And maybe he's right. This is the funkiest hurt, but it got to hurt. It got to. James said so. Because when it's finally over, when the trumpets quiet down, my body still knows how to dance all over the beat, still pounding in my heart. How to recognize these unrelenting sounds, these men making dissonant music. How to turn that hard hurt beat into my own sure feet, stomping it into beauty. Okay, it's weird to read in a silent um, space. So I'm just gonna imagine that people are snapping or clapping or making some sort of noise out there in Zoom land. Um, the last two poems that I'll read are actually, thank you, Erin, we're clapping. Um, the last two poems I'll read are linked sonnets. Um, and they tell the story of lynchings. So just a content warning, there um, is violence and um, lynching depicted in these poems. Um, and these two lynchings happened almost exactly 100 years apart to the day. Um, and there's informational epigraphs with each poem. So I'll leave the explaining to those epigraphs. But I will say that these poems not only are important to me because of how they show um, the, the falseness of these progress narratives that we cling to in our country, um, because of course we are, you know, still dealing with these issues of um, murder by the state or by concerned citizens, um, you know, to this day. But also, these poems mean a lot to me because I read them um, in front of Sister Sonia Sanchez um, in 2019 when she awarded me the Lucille Clifton Legacy Award at St. Mary's College of Maryland. 
um, we had two events that day and earlier in the day, I you know got to read a little bit and she got to read a little bit and I went first, thankfully, because who can follow Sonia Sanchez. And I remember reading these two poems and being very nervous um, because she was just sitting right there listening. And the whole time she sat with her eyes closed and her hands kind of like this, there's a picture that you can see. I'll, hopefully it's on my social media somewhere accessible so that you can find it. But she sat there and I read these poems and she said, when I finished, she said, now you see why I chose my dear sister to win this award. And I was just outdone. <laughs> so whenever I read these poems, that memory comes flooding back. And that was my Sonia Sanchez impression. I'm sorry, but she has a particular way of talking. And so I tried to emulate that. But these two poems, let's go ahead and read them. And thank you for listening. The first one is called Mary Don't You Weep or Mary Turner Resurrected. When Mary Turner threatened to press charges for the wrongful lynching of her husband in Brooks County, Georgia on May 19, 1918, she was strung upside down, her clothes were burned off and her unborn baby was cut from her womb and stomped to death. Turner was shot repeatedly and she and her baby were buried close by their murder site. Like all resurrections, it began with blood, dirt, unending light. The Georgia moss punctuated by camellias, their white hurt stretching across Brooks County. No blight to stain their leaves, just the ash falling bloody from Mary's emblazoned womb. Her baby, a fire, its single soft cry still igniting the air, could it be that even this baby, even this one-breathed angel was crucified to save us all? Maybe. Maybe Mary and her baby flew up from death in sweaty Georgia, her shallow grave shaken loose, finally free, resurrected. It turns out all along hell was earth. What else could she name that rock? covered in leaf and loam, not loving, not hopeful, and most certainly not home. Stefan, don't you moan, or to serve and protect. 22-year-old father of two, Stefan Clark, was shot 20 times on March 19, 2018, by Sacramento police in his grandmother's backyard. The gun police claimed to have seen him carrying was his iPhone. Is there a police protocol for grace? For the moment between show us your hands and shoot? That night, policeman, servant of the gun, did you give space for a man's innocence to bloom? Despite the loaded weight of your finger on the trigger, despite how the night painted that man bigger, made him a giant with a fireball in his hands despite the loud explosion of your fright. Innocence is for softer things, an open empty palm, a blooming flower, a spread of rocks becoming sand. Silly civilization, you thought we'd evolved beyond abuse of power, but again, a pruning. What a flower you were, Stefan, and what holiness in your body opening peddled in the white helicopter light. This, an Armageddon of bullets, flowers, stars, stripes. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Ashley. Um, those are such powerful, powerful poems. Um, next we have Kalisa Ray reading from her debut collection, Ghost in a Black Girl's Throat. A poet, queer rights activist, journalist, and educator in Durham, North Carolina, Kalisa Ray, who holds an MFA from Queens University, is the director of the Shaw University Writing Center and the newest writer for NBC, BLK, and Black Girl Nerds. Learn more about her work at kalisaray.com. Welcome, Kalisa. 
Thank you so much, Valencia. Uh, thank you so much to everyone at the Virginia Festival of the Book. It's an honor to be here. Um, I always want to note when when things in my bio um, aren't current, I'm actually no longer at Shaw um, and left full time to um, be on my book tour for Ghost in a Black Girl's Throat. So I'm just so honored to um, read from this work. Um, I'm actually going to, with respect to Bell Hooks, I'm going to read a palate cleansing poem before we dive into the poems in Ghost in a Black Girl's Throat, uh, because what Bell taught me is a lot about navigating the private um, spaces and the private fight for justice and love, um, as well as the political. And I want to start with a um, a private poem. It's called Belly Full of Gospel. You can find it at uh, a few places, but it's I'm going to be reading from the Art Lip uh, Lab. Belly Full of Gospel. Each morning, my grandmother rises to find her Bible still breathing, belting her favorite aria. A lion, a well, a sacrifice. Crack of dawn, coffee stains, scrolls making music at 6 a.m. Each page turn a chord she knows better than hot water cornbread and collard greens. Wailing blessed assurance, what a friend to crackling bacon. Belly full of gospel, summoning spirit to be there in the midst. Her back buckle and hand wave, awakening a holy ghost. Basha, Shadrach, Meshach, tongue speaking spells, casting at demons casting out demons, haunting this old house. While I'm on this tedious journey, a sovereign song soothing her aching hands. Walk with me, she asked, inviting him in the room. What a meditation, a ritual to welcome holy into a place held together by broken bread, a sacred invitation to dine with her and the browning hash, nothing but the blood and sunrise slicing sound, stirring a tent revival, lasting till midnight across her kitchen table. So I'm going to transition uh, into Ghost in a Black Girl's Throat. And what I wanna do is uh, bounce between um, those poems of, of private love and desire and justice uh, or, or the lack thereof, um, and the public. So I'm gonna move to circus acts, no more black girl magic. A black woman, this world will make you a circus freak show, tight rope walker, contort your name from Serarti to Sarah Bartman, Hotep Venus stage performer. Look how they abracadabra the royal exploitation of your form. Watch them dissect your broad bottom, saw you into science experiment, call your mending magic, your root balm and salve a work of the devil, sorcery. Go out the trap door and come back in the body of Beyonce, prized possession. They will spit shine the stage for you again. What a spectacular woman, two-headed and omnipresent, one foot here, one foot in Houdini state. Your trick is, look at all the wonder I can do with two hands in 24 hours. But when people say that's black girl magic, say, I have no magic. I make meals from crumbs, cast demons with just my tongue, envision possibility from potential. That makes me scientist, inventor, chemist, spiritual being. Tell them this is not super, this is survival. When they call you hero, when they hand you the cape anyway, Ask, haven't I carried enough? When they call your strength otherworldly, say it is the Venus rising in me and nothing more. Um, I want to transition out of um, that more public um, experience of navigating the space as a Black woman in America. Um, and with regard to the exploitation of our labor and transition over to um, body apology and a very personal experience that happened to me in Denver at the National Poetry Slam. Today, I left a space so white bodies could inhabit more comfortably. Today, I got out of my seat so a white family could sit in my place. 
Today I accommodated a white body. No, thank you. I am often accommodating. Today, a white family stood behind my table, pressing against my back. I was expected to leave, never asked. I should have planted my black body instead of being uprooted from my seat like a weed to be plucked. I was an apology. I apologize for my presence and no one says thank you. I apologize for my presence often. I get cut off, I end up apologizing. I am pushed past, walked in front of, excuse me, no response. Sometimes I go to white spaces, plant myself, just because I know my roots aren't welcome there anymore. So um, I've been thinking a lot about Belle today and her legacy and um, things that she taught me when I first experienced her work in college. Um, and um, I wanna read American Made. This poem um, is actually dedicated to um, Raven Simone. And one of the things that um, Belle taught me is not being afraid to share um, your stories around othering and oppression um, and assimilation um, that shaped who you are. Um, so this is, this starts with a uh, quote from Raven Simone when she was on the Oprah show. I am an American. I am not African-American. I don't know what country in Africa I'm from, but I do know my roots are in Louisiana. I'm an American and that's a colorless person. You undress your skin so easily as if it were, as if this ethnicity were a hoodie on a hot day and you thought it best to take off before recognized or assumed. When the weight of your identity becomes a burden, you refuse to carry it on this journey as a brown woman. But who are we kidding? We were both the light-skinned girl everyone in school asked, what you mixed with? We were both on the playground with Billy Sanford, pulled our hair and said we talk white. Both the only black girl on the cheerleading team and weren't invited to the team sleepover. We both got a rude awakening when our teachers changed our A papers to an F. But we stay trying to move, remove all that dead weight and tool. All these centuries of Ghanaian beating and Cape Town stitch work like we don't know where we were made. We stay climbing inside someone else's silhouette silhouette, trying to oblier unzip this Montclair passing skin. But I will always be the black ball gown in a room full of white wedding dresses. And I am reminded every day against this taffeta backdrop of muted cues and random fabrics, equality turns into invisibility the longer we exist. Saying I don't see color means I don't see you. You have made sameness another word for silent erasure. And I don't want you silent, girl. Not when there is still so much left to say. Um, as I wrap up, I want to read a piece that's really important to me. It's called Southern Foreclosures. I am not a native um, of the South, but I've been here for 16 years and learned my people also um, are from Louisiana and Mississippi originally. I'm gonna read um, the story of uh, me experiencing the South for the first time uh, and the trauma of that. It's called Southern Foreclosures. Long back roads still rattle me, still make me fear being asked to step out the nightstick, the gun, being turned to roadkill left on curb forgotten. Two, pitch black nights, Remind me of the torch, deep fried flesh, tarred and feathered, watching bodies swing like gruesome drive-in films. Open fields remind me of the leather whips, raking fingers through grass, blood, sweat, lathered cotton body parts left out for fer fertilizer. Farm animals grazing, buying and selling meat, ripping baby from mother for consumption, burning and branding the slaughter, hanging out to dry like jerky. Five, big plantation houses remind me of house slave and field nigga, of maid and mistress, of dinner service, bronze bodies, expensive ornaments fresh off the auction block. State fairs remind me of come see the hanging Negro. Where can I place my beard? This one has strong back, good teeth and broad shoulders, not the whole family. How much for the little boy and girl? 
Hunting season and wild woods remind me of running through forest, bullets grazing black skulls, branches cutting ankles, underground railroads hiding under the creek from the coon dogs and sniffing out the smell of a runaway. Eight, the Cape Fear River reminds me of the drowning. The throwing bodies over the bridge to hide the evidence, the vanishing of whole families, how they threw us over ships like rotten catfish. Nine, box boxing matches remind me of strapping black boots, fighting for bets, bare knuckle knocking out until unconscious for entertainment, toasting to the tearing of flesh, smoking a cigar in celebration. 10, Southern Belle and sweet tea smells like centuries of injustice. 11, Southern, Southern comfort tastes like privilege. 12, Southern hospitality sounds too unsettling to ever feel like home. Um, I wanna just wrap up with a line um, going back to personal. And this is, my grandmother never spoke of her body and that'll be it for me. Thank you so much again for having me. In my dream, she is under a man that knows about satisfaction and indulgence, a giver and a pleaser, one that doesn't hand over the chocolate but rubs the morsels on her lips, leans his lens down to the center of her mouth and says, here, take. In my dream, I came from pleasure, from men that believe the arch in her back was medicine for aging hands. That foreplay cures cataract, cataracts better than THC and all good pipes burst when tapped at the right place. In my dream, she is body embraced and thirsting for more. Gushing knowing dying in ecstasy would be a sweet death. That anticipation is the realest form of feminism there is. Thank you so much, Virginia Festival of the Book for having me. Wow, amazing. Thank you, Kalisa, for those fantastic poems. Um, so Crystal Wilkinson is going to close things out for us. Crystal Wilkinson is the poet laureate of Kentucky and the author of Perfect Black, her debut poetry collection. Her other books include a novel, The Birds of Opulence, winner of the Ernest J. Gaines Award, and a short story collection, Blackberries, Blackberries, winner of the Chafin Award for Appalachian Literature. Learn more about Crystal at crystalewilkinson.net. We're all yours, Crystal. Thank you. Um, it's as difficult as it is, I also want to give a shout out to um, Kentucky's own. Um, Bell Hooks, Gloria Jean Watkins, um, who was not only um, my mentor on the page, but also my dear sister friend. So yesterday was hard, um, today is hard, and it will be hard for many of us for a long time. So bear with me. terrain. The map of me can't be all hills and mountains. Even though I've been country all my life, the twang in my voice has moved downhill to the flat land a time or two. My taste buds have exiled, exiled themselves from fried green tomatoes and rhubarb for goat milk and pine nuts. Still, I return to old ground time and again, a homing blackbird destined to return. I am plain brown bag, oak and twig, mud pies and gut rich and gospel in the throats of old tobacco brown men. When my spine crooks even further toward my mother, I will continue to crave the bulbous tang of wild shallots the familiar game of oxtails and kraut boiling in a cast iron pot. I toe dive in all the rivers seeking the whole of me, scout virtual African terrain, sifting through ancestral memories, 
but still I'm called back home through hymns sung by stout black women in large hats and flowered dresses. You have to risk the briar bush to reach the sweet dark fruit and ain't no country woman all through piney woods. There is pluck in cayenne pepper. There is jute joint gyrations in the young and barren girth of this belly and these supple hips. All roads lead me back across the waters of blood and breast milk from ocean to river, to the lake, to the creek, to branch and stream, back to the sweet rain, to the cold water in the glass I drink when I thirst to know where I belong. And um, one of the things that I um, admired most about my sister, Gloria Bell Hooks, um, was her love for Kentucky, no matter uh, how far and wide she was known, um, she chose to come back home. Um, and no matter what anybody says about Kentucky, and we all know there's plenty to say, um, we have given birth to two of the most prolific, most profound uh, literary genius, geniuses, Black literary geniuses in, um, in the world, um, both Sister Bell Hooks and Gail Jones. And I'm very proud to be a Kentuckian. Um, I'll read a couple more. I didn't realize uh, that I was gonna have a, a breakdown. Um, baptism. Flatwoods, Kentucky. Wade in the water, wade in the water, children. Wade in the water, God's gonna trouble the water. Imagine a girl, not yet troubled, dressed in a crisp white dress, black patent leather shoes and new white tights, pressed hair smelling of royal crown, bangs curled under glistening. He was the preacher, the Reverend William H. Mills Jr., Long, good hair, slick back, pearl-handled cane, pocket watch chain dangling from a double-breasted suit. We stand in water up to our knees. The congregation reads scripture, eyes peeking up between hymnals and Sunday hats. The Bible is handed to the deacon. I baptize you in the name of the Son, the Father, and the Holy Ghost. See me submerged in cold creek water that seeps into my nostrils, tastes like danger in my mouth. I fight the hand of the preacher come up, gasping and crying. Bless her heart, she's feeling the spirit, Sister Usher says under a heavenly hat. Everybody claps and commences says to sing of being washed in the blood of the lamb. But I didn't feel devotion, felt wicked with my secrets. Wasn't even sure what the Holy Ghost was. See me with my legs closed and my skirt tail down. See me cover my knees. See me bless my food and comfort was found in baptismal rewards. A bottle of orange knee high, a sanctified fried chicken leg, corn pudding and German chocolate cake. Let the church say amen. My full belly, the most sacred part. One of the things uh, about this book is that uh, it's divided up into three sections. The first section is um, about girlhood, my uh, rural black girlhood. Um, the second section is sort of a, a, a come of, coming of age politically. And uh, the third section is about uh, who the woman, the woman that I am now. Um, so the book is basically um, a memoir in verse in many ways. And, and one of the things that the book grapples about, uh, grapples with is my mother's um, um, battle with uh, mental illness. And so um, one of the things I remember growing up as a child was that as in many country kitchens, there was always an animal splayed out uh, when I came home from school. And so uh, this particular story is about um, me wondering, my mother being institutionalized again and me wondering where she was and uh, coming home to a hogshead in a, in a galvanized tub. 
asking about my mother. In the small kitchen, the hog's head weaves the gamey scent of death throughout the house. My grandmother scrapes black hair from the hog's pink head with the sharp blade of her butcher knife. I ask her about my mother. I always ask her about my mother. I play paper dolls under a Formica table with pearls around my neck and pink lipstick from my mother's treasure chest. My grandmother places the head into the tub and I watch her hands, wait for her to tell me where my mother's gone. My grandmother fills the tub with water. I hate that she always reminds me of all she's done for love. Remember, remember, hair, face, knife. She lifts the heavy tub and situates the hog upon the stove, covering all the burners and turns on all the eyes. August 9th, 1974. This is not a political poem. I'm just remembering how I was eating cheese, eggs and toast when Richard Nixon resigned, how cousins gathered around the TV cross-legged on the floor, how I wasn't studying no president, how I was studying my cousin's friend, Mark, tall Mark with the Afro as big as the glow back home on Miss Rigney's desk. This is not a political poem because I was 12 and wearing lip gloss and hot pants, flowers in my hair, so many miles from my grandmother's reach that summer. This is not a political poem, but today I'm thinking about how we got here. I'm thinking about the woman I've become. This is not a political poem, but today I'm thinking about guns and rape culture and men who can't think beyond the power of their pricks. This is not a political poem, but I am thinking about the swagger in the walk of a 15 year old boy in Ohio and wondering what kind of man he became. I wonder if he had any children. I wonder if they are alive. And um, I'll read two more um, just to round it out so it's not so very dark. Uh, black body. My black body is a boulder, a stop sign. Sometimes I think my body is graceful, a song of freedom. Sometimes I think it is something that every eye cast away. I must concentrate if I want to fit into small spaces, slip into the eye of America's needle. Twice last week, I went without eating, filling up on self-loathing and discontent, only to give in to a slice of pound cake and a bowl of ice cream. To stay awake, I drink a glass of tea and watch the flawed reality of television housewives. Before bed, I stretch myself out along the couch and place my feet in my husband's lap. I can't stop thinking about the little black girl in the back of Philando Castile's car. Mommy, please stop screaming so they won't shoot at you. Four years old, she saw her mother's unarmed boyfriend shot, bleeding, dead on the front seat. I can keep you safe, she tells her mother. My body embarrasses the famous white woman at the writing conference as if my fat will rub off on her if she gets too close. When I'm sick, I want buttered sweet rice and a tender hand moving in circles on my back. Yesterday, I ate meatloaf, mashed potatoes and green beans at the Cracker Barrel in Tennessee. The white waitress called me baby doll. Once, I remember feeling the quickening of babies in my womb four tiny hands pressed against my navel, four tiny feet pressing against my ribs. And I'll close with a, a love poem. Uh, this um, poem is for my husband, Ron. And uh, today, when I think of him, who's in the other room, um, I think of how many times uh, um, that Bell would say, can I find Sister Crystal? Where can I find Mia Ron? Uh, she she loved him so much. Um, witness for Ron Davis. I'm convinced that if you could have seen my grandmother standing in the doorway waiting for him to come home from the fields, if you'd smelled that spectacular evening thick with sweat and felt the pulsing of the stars, 
If you'd borne witness to the animal's moans echoing in the holler that night, if you just could have seen the hair rise up on granddaddy's arm like that, like offerings to God when his elbow touched hers. If you could have seen her longing dissipate just a little as he came to the door, smelling like a day's work, you should have seen them close enough to breathe the same air while not even touching. He smiled at her without smiling. If you could have seen them watching me, watch them, then you'd know how much I love you. If you could have heard her say, you want some supper? We got pie. Thank you. Thank you so much, Crystal. That was beautiful, really beautiful. Your poems are, are so rich and, uh, and, and thoughtful. Um, and thanks to the three of you. Thank you for your poems and for your incredible voices. Um, it's so perfect to be sharing this space with you today after losing bell hooks. Um, my phone is full of a long chain of text between me and my community, you know, cause it's just, it just doesn't seem possible that she's not in the world anymore. So yeah, thank you. I, I, I think this was the perfect way to spend my afternoon. Um, and I'm happy that we have time for Q&A. Um, I have a few questions that I'd like to ask. And if we have time, we, we can see if, the, if we have questions from our audience, me audience members. Um, my first question is, um, could you each talk about your artistic development and what drew you to writing poetry? I'll start us off. Um, my artistic development and what drew me to writing poetry. Um, I started writing poems when I was seven years old. Um, I had always loved to read. Um, in my family, we're just a bunch of nerds. Like all we do is, you know, read and make art and, um, you know, that kind of thing. So I already was into reading, but when I was seven, I um, had to recite a poem to my class or recite something to my class. I had been reading a book of poetry called Honey I Love by Eloise Greenfield. Um, and there's a poem in that book called Harriet Tubman, which I chose to memorize. And so I remember um, getting ready to recite this poem. And at the time, at seven years old, I was a little insecure. Um, I had still all of my tonsils and adenoids inside of me. They were enlarged and made me sound sick all the time. So I hated to speak. I was a little bit shy. Um, and I was really still trying to figure out what it meant to be a Black person and also a weird artsy person. And also, I mean, the list goes on and on. I was also what you might call a proper speaking girl. And I really was like, man, I wish I could sound like other Black people, but I didn't, at least in my mind, before I understood that there are multitudes of ways, you know, to be a Black person. Um, so I memorized this poem. What a long answer. I memorized this poem and I got in front of the class and I remember starting to recite Harriet Tubman didn't take no stuff, wasn't scared of nothing neither, didn't come in this world to be no slave and wasn't gonna stay one either. And I remember just feeling all of those insecurities and worries just go away. There was only me and the poem and the, the feeling that the poem gave me. I felt black in a way that I um, didn't allow myself to feel before. I felt confident, I felt like my voice was something to love instead of hate. Um, and so from that day on, I started writing poems in my little, my spy journal. I was really obsessed with Harriet the Spy. So I would spy on my family and write things down in the book. Um, but I wrote poems and I've been doing it since that day. Um, and the evolution um, really has just been getting back to that level of um, honesty and authenticity and writing about blackness writing about myself I definitely took a turn away from that during my formal education as we all know once you get into school and you're the only black person um, you know in the room around the workshop table you start to feel like your perspective isn't valuable or you know you don't see um, yourself reflected sometimes in the work that's presented so the evolution for me has been to get back to that seven-year-old girl who was just writing because it's what felt natural and electric and necessary um, and to write about blackness without apologizing for it so yeah. 
Thank you. I want to piggyback off Ashley because this is kind of freaky. That's almost very similar to my journey. I was obsessed with Harriet the Spy. So my mom tells this story about how when I was seven, um, I used to take out my spy journal and spy on the neighbors. And that's how my love of story came about. So I used to get that and my little gadgets. Um, and I had these Tupperware bins still to this day, they're there in my room of stories. And I would collect details and then go back and create those into these just like wild stories about the scandalous things the neighbors were up to. Um, because I was obsessed with the idea of imagining myself somewhere else. Um, so I used to kind of fall into the stories of others, but also I too um, had a class where we had to memorize poetry and I went to private school my whole life. So I chose a Nikki Giovanni poem to memorize because I never saw myself seen in the, in the work that they assigned. Uh, I went to a very rigid um, private Christian school where I was one of the only black girls. Um, and I didn't, except for at home, I didn't really know about a lot of black authors that I love today. And so I had to kind of um, vicariously through my parents find out about Nikki and Maya and Sonia. Um, and so I memorized my little poem and set it at church and set it at school too. Uh, and the rest was history. I just kept writing stories until I collected, you know, this big stack uh, of, of, of fiction and nonfiction in my room. Uh, fast forward to college, it wasn't until I decided to, to leave UNCW, which is what the book is all about, the racism there, and go to a historically black college did I fall back in love with the art of poetry uh, and writing because I um, was surrounded by my people and, and uh, surrounded by our literature uh, and fell in love with it again and got my, my degree there, my MFA. And like Ashley said, I think it, it came full circle. I didn't see myself reflected when I was young. And so much of what I'm trying to do now is write um, stories where I see myself and I feel seen, known and heard um, so that others do as well. And so that's kind of been uh, my journey. Well, I think um, every journey of a, of a black woman writer begins with a, a, a bookish girl. Um, so mine did too. I was a, a shy, um, bookish girl being grandparent raised. Um, my mother was absent, um, certainly in rural Kentucky, the, where I grew up. Um, <clears throat> my family was the only black family uh, that I knew. Uh, everybody black that I knew was a relative. Um, so I too uh, didn't have exposure to black art until I really, until I was in college. Um, but what I was exposed to was, um, you know, art uh, in working, in the working art sense. Um, my grandmother made quilts, my grandfather whittled, um, and books. Um, I remember knowing how to read before I went to school. My grandmother always told the story that um, once I'd read all the books in the house, then I started writing my own. And at first she would, I would make up stories and she'd write them down for me. And then very quickly I began to, to write them down for myself. Um, as far as poetry is concerned, um, I still consider myself primarily a, a storyteller. I wrote poetry early on, and I think almost all of my poems, I, I haven't gravitated to any other forms uh, of poetry except for narrative poems because I'm primarily a fiction writer. Um, all of my poems were a private way for me to process. Uh, when I began to Publish poems, I found that I felt extremely exposed, extremely vulnerable in ways that I didn't feel and still don't feel that in fiction, because in fiction, you have this opportunity to put a thread of truth about yourself and then you layer the fiction on. So there's something sort of, you know, gleeful about like, ah, oh, it's there and the reader doesn't know. But I feel like um, when I'm writing poetry, the, uh, you know, because of the distillation um, of the of the words, but also I think for me it's the distillation of the impetus for the poem. Um, the truth is there, sort of rearing its 
its way. Uh, and I feel like that poetry is a, an art form of vulnerability for me. Thank you. Yeah, lots of connections there. Um, I'm, 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 I can sort of identify with, with all three of you. Um, so while your poems and the worlds they describe are quite different, you all clearly have a shared interest in weaving together private and public history. Can you talk about the importance of history in your work? Well, I'll just say for me, um, the history is both, both both communal and it's personal. You know, I think I deal uh, a lot in my art and also in my fiction, in my nonfiction too, I'm working on a memoir. Um, right now um, with the concept of Sankofa. So, you know, sort of standing where you are, there's always this sort of looking forward, but uh, I don't think we're whole unless we're always reaching back. And whether that's reaching back to your sort of, um, your own sort of um, psychological and material and emotional history, uh, what you know about it, and then looking at your individual community. So I'm looking at, at Black Kentucky, I'm looking at Black rural Kentucky. And then because we are all connected, um, then you have to look at what got us here, right? You have to look at, at the history that makes us all who we are. Um, and of course, as Black people in America, we can't, it's not all of who, who we are. Um, I think we need to look at Black joy more, but what got us here, the white supremacy that got us here uh, has to be looked at and grappled with. And I know few black artists that don't find themselves grappling with that history in some way. Yeah. What Crystal said is what I want to say. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I definitely don't see history as a linear thing. I think we make a huge mistake in um, the Western world, at least, by acting like things that are in the past are over or they have no impact on us. Um, I grew up in Birmingham, Alabama, and everybody already knows, you know, what went down here. Um, but I think growing up here really solidified for me the fact that, oh, my camera's doing its weird thing. I'm going to turn it off and still answer the question. Um, but the fact that the history that has happened is still very much a part of us today. Even though I was not alive in 1963, everything that happened during that year is in me still. I can't walk down a street downtown and not understand who walked there, who died there, who didn't want me walking there, who still doesn't want me walking there, etc. cetera. Um, so it has to show up in the poems as well. And there's really no history that's private if you think about it that way. Even if I'm talking about my, my own grandmother, there is, public history in that, what she had to go through, um, how she made a way for all of us to exist. So I'll stop there. If I could offer anything different from Crystal's beautiful answer and Ashley's beautiful answer, I would just say that I've been reading the book, The Body Keeps the Score. And I think that that trauma of our past stays in our cells. It stays in our body, it stays in our mind. Uh, and as someone who is in a lot of therapy after coming to the South, I think that much of my reason for preserving and talking about our history comes from me needing to heal from it. Um, and so I needed to learn about it and research and talk um, as a way to first reclaim things that were hidden from me. Um, so like I said, many years, I didn't know, I didn't know about Tulsa growing up. I didn't know about um, 1898 and my, my book talking about the Wilmington 1898 race massacre. I knew very little about Birmingham. And so I was so angry when I got to the South that I wasn't taught those things, um, that no one passed those stories down to me. And if they did, they kind of glazed, the matriarchs kind of glazed over it. Um, so that um, recalling and retelling of history for me is um, a way for me to get back what I feel like I was lost um, through my maturation, things that I needed and wanted to know um, that were concealed. And like I said, a healing 
for me to almost rehash it and dig it up and then learn how to, to heal from, from it by, by learning about my history. And in doing so, I learned about my ancestry. You know, my, my people come from, I was born in Gary, Indiana, but my people come from Mississippi and Alabama. Um, and my paternal side, the freed slave owned islands off of Louisiana. Um, I would have never known that really and had a passion to know that had I not started learning about um, history and my history and the legacy um, of the South and Southern racism. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Um, I think we have time for, for one more question. And um, that question is, um, could you talk about one of your favorite poems in your book, in, your, in the book you read from and, and why it's a favorite? I'm gonna sneak in quickly um, and say, one of my favorites is a poem called All Y'all Really from Alabama. And it's my favorite because I loved writing it. I mean, that part was super fun for me. It's a sonnet, it's like a secret sonnet. Um, and it's saying something that I have been trying to say forever. Um, and that is, you know, that racism doesn't just exist in the South. And even if you wanna say, but slavery, yeah, but slavery benefited the whole country. So, you know, like it, it's everyone, it's everywhere. Um, but that is my favorite because of what it says, because of the form, and also because I feel like it's become like my like greatest hit poem. I feel like I'm always reading it. I didn't read it today. I'm trying to diversify. Um, but I got to read it on Good Morning America for TJ Holmes, who is beautiful um, in person and on TV. Um, so I think about that exciting memory and just how far the poem and the book seems to be going without me. I mean, it's doing it on its own. Um, so that's that's my favorite. Thank Mine you. would probably be my title piece, Ghost in a Black Girl's Throat. I think it um, best encompasses what it's like to be a kid from Indiana outside Chicago and then come to the South to college and then tell you, hey, your city, you feel uncomfortable and depressed all the time because there was, <laughs> a massacre of your people in this town that nobody told me about uh, until I was later in my, my late 20s. Um, and I had to ask the folks at church. So I think Ghost in a Black Girl Throat, the title piece would, as Ashley said, it's kind of my great hit, but also I think it just says everything I need to say about the experience of being a, being a migrant to the South and how traumatic that was as a Black woman and what it is to navigate as a Black woman in the South. So that would be my favorite. Thank well, because you. these poems are sort of a compilation over um, several years, there's there's lots depending on the decade, uh, which is my favorite. But um, just looking at them today and, and thinking about them and thinking about the question, I think um, there's a lyric essay in here called um, Dig, If You Will, The Picture that sort of um, explores my fangirldom of, of Prince. Um, but underneath it are things that we don't talk about. Um, child sexual molestation, um, things that go on in the black church. And so um, it's probably the poem, not a poem, it's not really a poem, could be a prose poem, but I'm calling it a lyric essay. Um, it's not one that people talk about because people still don't wanna talk about those things, but it's the one that I get mail, snail mail and email about all the time and um, still get comments on, uh, it originally appeared in the Oxford American. And um, so people often send me notes about it all the time. You can still find it online. And so people read that all the time and have, and say it either directly, um, this really moved me. It made me understand something about myself or, you know, reading your, your piece was therapy for my wife my sister, et cetera. Yeah, Poetry Heals. Um, thank you. Yeah, I, I love, I love, I, I feel like we could just keep this conversation going, um, but we are close to one o'clock. Thank you again to each of you for your, you know, for, for your incredible voices, for your poems. Um, yeah, this was the perfect way the perfect way to spend this afternoon. Um, I also wanna thank everyone who tuned in. Um, 
to everyone out there, please, please, please consider buying these poets' books from your local bookseller or through the links on vabook.org. Um, you can also check out future virtual events and watch past events hosted by the Virginia Festival of the Book at vabook.org. Um, and so I'd also like to, or I'd like to thank the organizers um, of the festival for this program and for all the important work that you do. So thanks again to each of our poets and just wishing everyone uh, a great afternoon and uh, you know a, a great holiday break. Thank you.